very honored to be here, super fancy conference. Um, I'm very happy to talk about our recent research on lowly source language IE, and this is part of our baby project uh, called DAPA Law Light, um, and uh, the, all the work has been done by my Arson students. Um, okay, so let's talk about what is IE first. Um, many of us know we are trying to find information from all kinds of natural language text. It can be a sentence, can be a document, or can be a collection of documents. And the goal is to convert this kind of unstructured data into a structured graph. Sometimes we call this as knowledge graph or information network or knowledge network. But uh, in this graph, each node can be an entity, and uh, the edge could be a relations and the events involving these entities. So here's this example. You can see, uh, given this sentence, we want to find there's a located relation, and there's a movement event, and uh, we know the destination, and we know the person who is being moved. So um, it has been a, a very active research area. Uh, it's maybe the most popular area right now at ACL. Um, we have been working on this for more than three decades. Uh, if we look at the node expression, we can look at the uh, sentence and try to label each token one by one, say uh, it's beginning of a person, uh, inside the location, or outside the location. So basically, you need to convert this as a sequence labeling problem. Uh, and the most popular DAM model try to look at the uh, direction, bidirectional contact and uh, look at the uh, interdependency of labels. So um, this task has been very successful for English. Um, and if we look at a relation event, usually the problem is more complicated because we need to look at a very complex sentence and very long, wide contact. So usually people do is, uh, what people do is try to convert a sentence into a dependence graph or use uh, semantic parsing, convert this into a graph structure, and then we can shorten the distance between the nodes. For example, for this relation uh, between the person and, and, and the facility, we can look at the dependence paths uh, in, in, in the sentence, there are four tokens between them, but in the tree, you can only see two edges. So the content becomes much shorter. And then what you can do is to encode this graph and then uh, label some training data and then convert the graph into the structure, into the relation structure. So we have been doing this for uh, many years. For English, it has been quite successful. We are generally happy. Usually what we do is we ask a consumer to tell us what labels to uh, assign to node and edge, and uh, then we hire annotators. Um, usually we need uh, 500 documents for training, and then we sit down uh, to design features, maybe incorporate some embedding, fancy embedding, and into the model. So it has been OK. But the problem is that once we have a model for English, we have no way to uh, apply this to other languages. And uh, usually, the, these models are very fragile. When you train a model from a domain, it cannot be applied to other, other domains. Um, so uh, what we would like to do is to extend this kind of framework to all the languages. Because we have been too arrogant for many decades considering English as the center of the universe. But English really doesn't deserve to be the center of the universe. So if you look at the number of living languages, we have 3,000 languages, and uh, more than 300 of them have digital news data. So the idea here is whether we can find certain concrete information from low resource languages. For example, if I want to know what uh, Aung San Suu Kyi was doing last week, maybe the information will be from Burmese news, not from English news. So we would like to break this kind of language barrier using um, English resource, English knowledge, and then we can apply that to other languages. Um, so it's uh, not a, a trivial problem because the annotations for relation events are usually much more expensive and very complicated than uh, entity annotation. So let's look at the general idea first. The idea is basically to let the multiple languages share some common space, common grounding, so that we can apply a model trained from English with the same representation and then apply that to other languages. So the similar to uh, you know, when you see kids play with each other in the kindergarten, if one kid wants to help the other kids, uh, he or she needs to grow first. So we would like to feed some milk, which is training data, and um, the system developer uh, should improve their performance. And then uh, if these two kids share some common representation, then we can apply the model trained from their old uh, domain or older languages to the target language. So that's the general idea. And um, it has been very successful for node transfer, uh, what requires entity 
uh, transfer. Usually, when we um, construct a model, we try to leverage all kinds of language universal features. For example, you can look at multilingual word embedding and then uh, try to apply the model using those training data that have uh, language independent features. Um, so for entity transfer, we can also uh, try other um, language universal frameworks, for example, if you can ask a non-speaker to look at the translations and uh, the, uh, some language space features, you have a reasonable guess about what is being a name or what is, what, what is a type of the entity. Um, so uh, there's a lot of work recently um, uh, doing this. So this is an example showing how can we train a model from English and apply that to Russian. So in the bottom, you can see there's an English sentence, training sentence, and a Russian test sentence. So if we use cross-lingual word embedding, we can project that into one space. And then you can apply a by STM to train the model from English and apply to uh, Russian. So this has been very successful. However, this kind of uh, framework needs a lot, a lot of uh, bilingual dictionaries and the parallel data. So uh, one of the efforts we have uh, tried to reduce the cost last year is to construct this cluster consistent common space. So the multilingual word embedding assumes that two words like orange and apple, if they are close to each other in English, they should be also close to each other in Chinese or Arabic or African languages because uh, the distribution is consistent. So it, we try to extend that hypothesis to cluster consistent. So that means if you have professor cluster and a student cluster, if they are close to each other in English, you can reasonably assume they are also close to each other in other languages. So the, now the key issue is how can we construct clusters? We designed six different ways to do this. Uh, one uh, method is to leverage language universal database. So many of us who have got uh, linguistics training might know that linguists have spent the past decades on constructing this kind of database. We just don't know where they are and how to use them or how to read them. So we try to clean them up. For example, we use the WARS and CCLS. In those databases, they provide us word classes. For example, they will tell us how to say weekdays in Russian. And they will also tell us what is the equivalent suffix to convert qualify to quality. And then what we assume is if two words in two languages, if they belong to the same class, or if they share similar syntax feature or morphology features, then they should belong to one cluster. So they should be aligned to each other. And then we also use the neighbors in modeling lingual space. Uh, for example, here, if you don't know translation of Syria, but the Syria's neighbors are all country names in Russian and English, you can align these two clusters. We also use the great work on um, cross-lingual paraphrase done by CCB at UPenn, and they, it's available for 60 languages, so we try to use that paraphrase. And uh, we also use character embedding. Um, the problem here is uh, none of the previous multilingual word embedding really cares about knowledge or entities. For example, if you want to represent the uh, name John Smith, if you just do average uh, or um, some of the um, embedding of John Smith, basically you assume that all the people who have last name Smith share similar semantic representation, which is obviously wrong. And also this kind of embedding cannot disambiguate Apple fruit and Apple company. So what we would like to do is to be able to disambiguate the different uh, identities for entities and also try to give a unique identity for their um, entity mention. So what we did is we replaced each anchor text in Wikipedia with its anchor link title. If it has an English title, then we replace that with English title. So for example, here Xiaomi was replaced as a Xiaomi technology in Chinese, and then uh, Apple is replaced with uh, Apple Incorporated. So then the sentence will become a code switch sentence, which will read like Xiaomi is known as a uh, Chinese Apple Incorporated. So we do this for all the 300 languages in Wikipedia. Um, including English, and then you can learn a rotation matrix to align the red uh, Chinese space with the green English space because we have the shared anchor, English anchor link as the pivots. So of course we cannot do this alignment perfectly because there are always some words in a language which don't exist in another one. For example, uh, in Chinese we don't say oops because we are not that emotional. So you will see a lot of outliers, um, but this two spaces can be reasonably aligned for entity generation purpose. So um, after we do that, then we can just train the model from uh, um, English and apply to Chinese. But 
um, because of the word order is different and syntax is different and the multilingual word embedding or uh, joint entity word embedding really ignore the word order and the structure, so not all the sentences are useful. So uh, what we tried is we tried to train a word discriminator and a sentence discriminator. So that if the discriminators cannot distinguish the original sentence from the target language and the source language, that means that's a good sentence or good word. And then we use that for training. So, um, the results are pretty good. Uh, if we don't have any training data for the target language, we usually can get above 50% F score. And if you do have a few sentences, like you know, 100 sentences for the target language, you can merge that with the English sentences, and we can get above 60% F score. And the cool thing is, the real useful information is being transferred from the source to target, and the. the source language doesn't have to be related to the target in terms of language family, because as long as they share similar topics or entities, they will uh, share a lot of pivots in the common space. So we tried the experiment of, for using um, Russian to help Chechen. So Chechen and Russian are two very different languages, and Chechen is an extremely low resource language because it's only spoken by two million people. That's like the uh, small town in China. But they have very few resources from local news. So what we did is we tried to apply the uh, common space between Russian and Chechen and then train a model from Russian test on Chechen. So you can see we can improve the performance from about 46 to 69. And we also looked into the results to see what is being transferred. So in the table, you can see some examples. For example, in the, in the third one, uh, you can see a university called CSU. It's a very popular university in Russia, and it only appears once in Chechen data but it appears 183 times in Russian. So that indicates that if you can leverage the topic-related data in a, a higher resource language, then you can use that for the low-resource language. Uh, so we're very happy about the entity rejection results, and also the cool thing is you can now apply this to cross-lingual anti-linking and do that in an unsupervised fashion, because all the mentions in any language are now aligned with the English entity in the common space, so that you can just cos uh, compute the cosine similarity, just get the entity candidate. So this is a very different paradigm from what we have been doing about eight years ago uh, when uh, TechKBP just launched. At that time, we needed 3,000 mentions for training. You learn a learning to rank framework and design features and do the ranking. So we compared the results with the state-of-the-art model uh, at that time. Uh, you can see for many languages, we get even higher performance than supervised model. Uh, and the, this project has been used for many real applications. So last year um, and uh, the previous two years, DARPA have been using our project for um, um, real-time monitoring of disaster. So we did uh, experiments in uh, Macedonia and uh, West Africa, and uh, um, this year we are doing that in Bulgaria. So we have shared this system publicly uh, for 287 languages, and uh, uh, it's available as an open source, Docker container, and API. Um, however, that's not the end of the story, because if you look at the results, uh, we did a pretty good job at localization, so we can find the events, the relations, and the places, and uh, link them to English geo names, so you can uh, monitor, for example, which place need water, which place need evacuation, but the topics or events or relations are always wrong, uh, often very incorrect. So that inspired us, maybe we should do something uh, more. Uh, in order to do this task. So we would like to do relation and event argument transfer so that you can transfer the whole graph. The hypothesis comes from a linguistic paper called um, uh, relational facts are usually typically expressed by identical patterns, even though they use very different languages to express the pattern. Um, the patterns are usually consistent. So if we look at the dependency results, usually the paths between two nodes are usually identical or similar across languages. So this inspired us, maybe we should use all the available language universal features to represent a dependence graph. So the edges are sharing the same labels. And if we look at the nodes, we usually use the same ontology for entity type. So that means the entity types are also language universal. And as I said, the multilingual word embedding and the entity embedding can also be considered as language universal. And usually we use the same label for past speech tag. So if you have a, a language universal, so past speech taggers, you can also use that to represent the nodes. 
So combining this kind of symbolic and the distributional representation, you basically can parse the two sentences. So the left side is an English training sentence, the right side is a Russian test sentence. So if we do universal dependence parsing, they are both converted into dependence graph, and then we can uh, represent each node using the universal speech tags, entity types, and then the uh, joint entity and word embedding. And the edge will be sharing similar labels. For example, here, between the person and organization, we see a path going from noun subject um, passive to object. And uh, they are identical, even though the whole structure, the graph, are quite different. So, uh, and then we can use graph neural network like GCN to uh, encode the whole graph because we can now borrow the representation from the neighbors to represent each node. So what we did is we consider each sentence as n times n matrix, and each uh, token is being initialized using these lang language universal features. So we combine four things, the uh, multilingual word embedding, and the past speech tag, and the depend dependence relation, and entity type. And then uh, in the previous layer, we can borrow the representation of the older neighbors in the dependence graph, and then we can derive the hidden uh, representation of the current node. So in that way, you have the global representation for the whole graph. And then we can consider relation as a classification problem. If you have two entity dimensions, then you can get this kind of uh, uh, graph representation for three things. One for the entity, the first entity, the second entity, and then the whole sentence. And then combine these three things to represent this relation, and then uh, classify that into one of the predefined types, and chain that from English. Similarly, for event, we can also consider the trigger and the entity as a pair, and classify that pair into one of the predefined event argument rows. And uh, the features also coming from the trigger node, the entity node, and the whole sentence. So by doing this, uh, then you can now look at the left side, the English training data. It's already uh, labeled as a movement, event, and the located relation. And the right side, the Russian sentence doesn't have any label, but they are sharing one GCN common representation. And then you're, now you can change a model from English, apply that to Russian. Uh, we tried the experiments on English, Chinese, and Arabic just because uh, we only have this human ground truth annotation for relations and events, and they are sharing a similar ontology. Uh, so we trained the model from this um, source language applied to test lang uh, target language. So you can see the results are quite promising, especially if you train a model from English, apply to Chinese, you get a 59F score, and that's very similar to 59.3 trained from Chinese to test on Chinese. And if you look at the learning curve, uh, here the black one shows the supervised model. So if you annotate more and more mentions, the performance go up. And then it's very uh, similar to uh, the red dash line that's trained from English. So that means we can save annotation cost for about 3,000 event mentions. So we have been doing this back in 2003, 2004, two years. 10 experts spent two years, a lot of money, annotating the Chinese event arguments. So that means those two years were a completely waste of time. So um, this also inspired us, maybe we can go even further, try to do um, image and uh, video um, event ingestion, relation ingestion. So before I joined this uh, AIDA, DAPA AIDA project, I was really, really arrogant by considering images and videos as a foreign language, because usually that's what we do in NLP. So we crawl the data from news agencies, and then we just skip the all the, we remove all the images and videos, we just take the sentences and then we do information ingestion. But that's completely wrong, because if you look at this book written by this journalist, he says, now is the time, the rise of the image and the fall of the word. Because when we wake up every morning, when we look at the multimedia news articles, we usually look at images and videos first, if I only have five minutes, because they tell you the most essential information. So by checking manually about 100 multimedia documents from VOA, we found that 34 uh, event arguments, they are only present in images. For example, if image is showing you a tank, that means the journalists will never bother to describe a tank in the, in the, in the text. So that means other event ingestion tasks or relation ingestion tasks we have been doing in the past were missing all this 34% of information. 
So we would like to extend the IE test from single data modality to multimedia multilingual. So the idea here is so we would like to still consider image and video as foreign language. We know we are missing a lot of information by doing this, but this is a starting point. So we build the alignment between multiple levels. So many people have been working on, for example, aligning region and entity. So we try to go that further by aligning the structures. We did a single graph parsing and uh, align that graph parts with the entity relation graph. And we also apply this visual semantic parsing, graph parsing, align that with the dependence graph and the AML graph. So by doing this, you can then take the multimedia document as input and then generate a knowledge base or event database uh, by pulling all the information from images and the text. So here in the text, you don't see anything talking about the target, but the image clearly shows you the airplane and the vehicle are the targets. So we did uh, entity detection and uh, single graph parsing and uh, eject the information from both data modalities generate a very comprehensive table. So uh, the basic uh, framework looks like this. So the left side, you can see we have a, a text ontology. This is what we want to judge. And we already have the text representation similar to what I showed about GCN for different languages. And on the right bottom is the image sync graph representation. So it's the same thing. You use After you get alignment, you can just project them into one common space and then train a model from English and apply that to images. So results are OK, not too great. So we get F score about 36%. So it's still far behind what we can do from text. But if you compare the results with the, the um, previous methods using region and uh, entity alignment and uh, uh, that ignored all the structure, results are much better. For example, in the first image, this, uh, this bounding box was detected as a jail um, argument as in arrest, just because it looks like a jail. Uh, and our structure alignment was successfully identifying this as a weapon for attack. And then in the second one, this guy was mistakenly identified as a man who is being arrested because his hands were probably behind his back. But our method was um, able to identify him as a man, an uh, entity that uh, is participant of a protest event. And then in the third image, the baseline method um, identified that bounty box, that man, as agent of arrest because that real agent, he only shows his back in the image. But uh, using our uh, multimedia common space, we were able to identify the, um, that man as a person who is being arrested, not the agent. Okay, so. Um, so far, we have been making a lot of really promising progress. For example, uh, four years ago, we can only deal with about one or uh, one to, between one and three high resource languages. We, now we can deal with 300 for uh, all these tasks. And uh, uh, for entity types, because we are using the joint entity and word embedding, we can extend the types from the cross-grained one to 16,000 types defined in Yago. Uh, and the relations events, the same thing, we can leverage the uh, joint representation between ontology and, um, and annotation, so we extend the, uh, the scale um, to 2,000, 1,000. Uh, and also for interlinking, like I mentioned, if you don't have any training data, you can get better performance than supervised model from five years ago, seven years ago. But uh, uh, if you do have some training data, combining these uh, methods, uh, transfer learning and the supervised model, you can get up to 16% improvement in terms of accuracy. And more importantly, we are able to save a lot of cost. You know, in, in uh, previous methods, we usually need to sit down and uh, spend half a year doing annotation. Now you can deliver a system for surprise language within uh, one, 10 hours. OK, so uh, in terms of applications, now we are applying this multimedia multilingual, i.e. to event recommendation, so you can uh, you, you, each morning, every morning you wake up and you can just use this system to monitor the events. If, if you can see this is coming from Ukrainian news and you can see uh, we identify this person as an argument for the attack events. And on the right side, you can see the recommended events which are related to this one. And then if you want to go further, try to identify the uh, complex events, uh, you can also try to detect the temporal and causal iteration. So the remaining challenges, uh, I don't think we are doing enough because none of the 
entity generation F score goes uh, more than 76% yet for any low resource languages. And relations events, we are still um, lower than 60%. So it's definitely far from uh, being able to um, commercialize or use for Google Knowledge Graph. So what, is, what are the remaining challenges? One important challenge is that we are still lacking background knowledge. So if we t um, take one moment to look at these examples, for the first one, um, how many people know what is this entity? It looks like a person, but it's not a person. It's called Luhunu Kata Logama Maha Devalaya. Maybe Indian students know what this is. Any idea? It's temple. Thank you. Um, so you know it, right? Before, you, yeah, okay. So she has background knowledge. So it's a temple because it says it's a, a festival. It's located in temple. Um, but it looks like a person, and it's out of vocabulary. How about the second one? It still looks like a person, but it's not a person. University, why? Admission and education, yeah. So if you look, use the BERT embedding or ELMO embedding, you won't be able to select these uh, context words and uh, do the reasoning. But uh, for human, we know it's a college and a university just because it's talking about education ministry and uh, you, know, you send the kid to this place, so it's college. How about the third one? Something was brought from India by the mainland. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, bad kids know the answer. So it's not a person. Uh, and and the, the final one, maybe many American students know, it's a White House because it's uh, the old address, the former address of White House. Anyway, so the idea here is that if we stick to the current framework, just use the distributional semantics and without any reasoning, without going in outside of the sentence, looking at the global knowledge, we are hopeless. We are still missing all these uh, important entities. And then in terms of events, what I showed in the, uh, in the recommendation system, we still don't know the uh, relations uh, between complex events. So this is a new DAPA project called Carlos. And here we want to induce the schema for complex events. We basically want to find out the temporal causality and the sub-event relations between these events for any languages and any data modality. And we also want to induce patterns. For example, a haircut usually depends, uh, depends on women or men, takes hours or days. And um, uh, speech, public speech usually take minutes to hours. So this kind of uh, useful patterns. And then you can just apply the pattern to any new domain, new language. Uh, without any attention cost. So I don't think I have time for a demo. I don't have a way to interact demo anyway, but if you go to my software page, you can play with those. I think that's all. Thank you. <laughs> so I actually don't know the format. Do I have time for questions? Have time for questions. Okay. Hi, Mona. Hey. Um, great work and great presentation. I have a couple of questions, actually. Mm -hmm. um, did you, um, in your work, so do you have any assumptions about the genre of the data that you're learning from? Um, we don't, but uh, that's a great question. Uh, we had a cell paper uh, try to deal with that problem in English. Mm -hmm. So we found that if we uh, uh, train model from news applied to, say, broadcast news, although the genres are quite similar, but the performance dropped significantly. It's like 10% or 20%, so it's a very bad problem. Mm -hmm. So I have to say, we were able to break the language barrier in this way, but we are still facing very serious problem about genre adaptation. Um, so the, 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 the key issue is because when people try to use distributional representation, they always assume that you have enough uh, content to represent each word. For example, if the word appears less than five times, you just ignore um, the, the preaching embedding. Mm -hmm. So it's very fragile. So we try to do some work on let the model, um, to open the black box and try to let the model dynamically model the content, like when you should focus on content, when you should focus on character embedding. And I think also it's important to incorporate more symbolic features. Yeah, so it's unsolved problem. In the, in the test data, we usually just get all kinds of genre, like news or tweets, right. and, and we didn't get time, chance to, to look into it, and that should be next step. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, 
question. Uh, I've seen you have using uh, uh, semantic parsing, some of these structured information mm -hmm. in your model. How much does the structured information, structured prior, uh, help? Oh, yeah, yeah. I didn't show the... I didn't have a chance to show the ablation test. Yes, so it ha uh, helped a lot for uh, Arabic, just because uh, uh, the, the, uh, the flat representation for Arabic relation events was not enough. So it's about 8% uh, uh, absolute improved F score. Chinese, only a little bit, because I think the Chinese entity annotation was better than Arabic. Uh, so it depends on language, but uh, uh, the, the uh, improvement was very significant. And uh, I already showed the, the results on um, uh, cross-media transfer. So you can see the baseline did not use any structured representation. The results were only like 2% F-score, and we got 36 by using the structures. Um, how much actually can you, you know, how, I suppose you can get more data, so mm -hmm. to actually, you know, the, in terms of sample efficiency, how, how much more data can you get to that structured, inf you know, the... Yeah, so I think the bottleneck for cross-media case is not on natural language, it's on the vision. So they have been doing a lot of work on semantic labeling, but the scenarios are always very peaceful, toy, example, like, you know, play soccer or cooking. No one cares about the real news. So the supervision we can get from vision side is really limited. So that's what we are doing now. We try to develop some new benchmark and new frame frameworks for identifying uh, complex events and situation recognition. And hopefully that can be aligned with the text um, better. Right now, the transfer is mostly from natural language to vision, not the other way around. I would say the multilingual case it really depends on universal dependence parsing people, and I, we really appreciate that you know they are extending the number of languages, but the, it, the performance varies across languages. So it depends on what what we are targeting at. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Sorry, I think we are running out of okay. time. Okay. Thank you very much.